Our final speaker for the session is uh, KK. KK is a distinguished professor of computer science and engineering in the University of California, Riverside. After uh, spending over 30 years in industrial like uh, digital equipment corporation and AT&T, he is an ACM, HPE, and AT&T fellow. Here you go, KK. Thank you, Jia. talk about uh, open source 5G core platform that we've built, um, my students, uh, and also JC, who's here from NYCU in Taiwan, and his students. And what we focused on is really to see how we can build an efficient and a low latency 5G core network. The last few talks have already covered all the wonderful promise about 5G, so I'm going to skip over it and basically say, look, there's been a lot of work that's been done in the radio. Um, what we're doing is looking at what can we do in the core network and uh, in the implementation of the core without um, changing the 3GPP protocol which has been standardized and uh, you know, going about trying to make that change means that we'll end up having to change all the user devices as well as the base stations and so on. So instead, what we've been looking at is what can we do in, within the core to really bring down latency and also, as a consequence, improve data plane performance as well. And another aspect that we've been looking at is if you look at the other promise that we have with, because of the higher bandwidth radios, is that you can actually also provide rural broadband service. And in that context, we see a need for more flexible packet handling. And not only in that context, but also for newer applications like gaming and so on, where you also need um, a larger number of flows to be treated for a user session. And so we look at how can we handle a large number of flows for the same virtual UE and look at how to give them the right treatment. So if you look at what we see as the role of the 5G core is that it basically allows user devices, UEs as we call, to go over the radio network to a core network where you are setting up user sessions, and from there to be able to communicate with the rest of the world. And so the demand on this cellular packet core is really to provide high performance, but also pr preferably prov uh, not bring in a lot of latency in its packet handling. If you look at what's been going on with the LTE and the previous generations, they've been built with purpose-built hardware. And now what we are seeing is the move to having these built using software-based network functions. Like, for instance, the AMF is the component that is involved in dealing with mobility handling. Um, the UPF is dealing with the uh, data forwarding, and a whole bunch of other uh, control plane uh, functions as well that work over what is called a service-based interface, which is a HTTP REST interface where all of these network functions communicate. What we see also with the core network is that this UPF, which is involved with data plane handling, has a tight dependence with the control plane so that before a UE can exchange data packets, control messages are processed by that cellular core to set up that UE's data path. And what you saw with all these measurements that people did in the last three, four papers is that the latency that they suffer ends up being partially there's a lot of other components, but partially also because of that tight uh, 
dependence between the control and data plane is likely not handled as well as it could be. So we've been looking at how can we build this better. So one of the challenges that we have is that this control plane NF communicates over this HTTP REST API, or maybe gRPC. The penalty of that is that you have serialization, deserialization, things that we understand well, and also copies, context switches, and protocol processing. So all of that contributes to protocol or control plane latency that we want to see how we can bring that down. So we have looked at how we can try through our core implementation to bring that down as um, low as possible. The second, and you've seen a bunch of uh, pre uh, presentations already about handover procedures. The handover procedure that I'm going to focus on is one where you go from a source G node B to a target G node B, that is a source base station to a target base station for a user device. And the way that the protocol is specified is that you have data continue to be forwarded to the source base station. It's buffered there. And then when you have the handover complete, then data is forwarded from the source G node B to the target. But the way it's done is it is through the core, that is through this UPF. And so there's a hairpin routing. And one issue is that there is additional delay because of that hairpin routing. The other is that you've got this source G node B that now potentially is a small cell with a small amount of buffering that now has to worry about how long do I wait and hold on to packets till that handover is complete. So we've looked at how we can modify that by doing in-place buffering at the core network and then forward it directly from that UPF to the target with no changes to the control plane protocol that has been specified. The third one is how do we handle a large number of packet handling rules for all these emerging use cases. And if you look at this PDR, that is basically the abstraction that the 5G data plane uses to handle data forwarding packets. And it basically points to a bunch of rules that then point to additional rules for really eventually telling you how to forward packets and what kind of QoS treatment needs to be handled, provided. These PDR rules typically are organized as a linked list. And if you were to continue to look at the traditional way that a session is treated, where a single UE has a single session, which is a single flow, you don't really need to worry. But as you go forward, we look at how we can actually have a fast PDR lookup and an update design so that we can improve scalability and also lower latency. The final thing is, when you look at handovers, and actually not handovers, I'm thinking about when we move over to the software-based functions, and you're going to implement it on uh, COTS hardware, then we need to deal with failure resiliency. The way the protocol is specified right now is that failure resiliency is by having the user device re-register. And the consequence is that you have a whole bunch of control messages that are exchanged to restore the session context. And yes, it's an obvious, simple solution. The responsibility is on the end user device. But it adds to a lot of additional delay and packet loss. So we've looked at how can we reduce that by having a sensible failure recovery procedure. So consolidation of NFs in a way that is sensible so that we can, through careful placement and using shared memory, 
simplify this whole service-based interface that has been the tradition of how the 5G control plane is implemented, reduce latency for handovers through this thing that we call smart buffering, simple idea, and for uh, dealing with more uh, rich treatment of flows, look at how we can do fast PDR lookup, which, which is basically taking the learning that we have over these last 15, 20 years on packet classification, and finally looking at how to do resiliency better. So let's look at the first thing that we did, which is to optimize the service-based interface. And for this, what we look to do is basically think of having the 5G control plane network functions treated as one unit. So that with those control plane NFs and the UPF as well in the 5G core unit, we can have shared memory for communication between the network functions in that core unit because they're all on the same node. So what we look to do is to have an orchestrator that takes these network function affinity into account in how those network functions are placed. We built it on top of OpenNet VM, which is this NFV platform that Tim Wood and I have been working on for many years now. And as a consequence of the shared memory communication, rather than using HTTP REST API for these network functions within the same node to communicate, we are able to get rid of all of the serialization, serialization deserialization work, no data movement, get rid of all of the kernel protocol processing overheads, context switch, and so on. So the idea is that you want to have this consolidation on the same node, which means that you need to be careful about how you do network function placement. And this is something that people have been working on also for several years now. So what we look to do is to have that orchestrator do that placement and have a load balancer that is UE aware so that you can now maintain affinity of the UE to a serving 5G core unit. Let's look at how we perform. I'm, I'm going to look at a simple message exchange. And if you look at previous sitcoms, there have been other efforts to improve this as well. And shared memory is the approach that we've taken. And the traditional 3GPP approach using REST and uh, HTTP with JSON uh, for a single message exchange takes about a millisecond. We take about 70 microseconds, which is a big improvement. And it is a fairly significant improvement over these other previous efforts to improve that interface as well. Now, when I look at that and say, what does it mean for the actual control plane operations that we typically see, I look at um, our L L25GC, as we call our implementation, and compare it with what our good friend had done before with free 5 gc using a kernel-based implementation, which was using what was recommended by 3GPP. And then we also uh, looked at saying, let's just change only the data plane using OpenNet VM, which is this intermediate ONVM UPF. This ONVM UPF shows a slight improvement, but when we get down to looking at using our low latency 5G core, we see almost a factor of two improvement in these control plane operations, whether it is for a session establishment or the two other operations that are much more critical for us, one, which is this handover. And the second is what they call paging, which is basically a user device going from idle to active when a new packet arrives. That basically directly translates to how much delay a packet experiences when your user device is idle. And the question is, does this improvement by a factor of two really make a difference? We've been working so hard with improving radios 
to give better throughput for sure, but also latency, and that reduces the latency down to about 10 milliseconds. But this reduction in latency that we look at for paging and handover gets you down by a factor of 100 milliseconds from 200 milliseconds for just only looking at what goes on in the core, not all the other activities. So we think that that is meaningful, and it will give you a meaningful QoE improvement that we'll see in a moment. The second was looking at how do we do forwarding rather than this hairpin routing going up back to the UPF and down. Instead, buffer at the UPF, that is at the core network, when you're going through the handover, and then forward it to the target. You can afford a much larger buffer at the UPF rather than at a small cell base station. And we've talked to a bunch of vendors about how much buffering that they have. And you can see some of that in the paper. And we completely avoid this hairpin routing. And the way we do this is there's a whole bunch of message exchanges going on between these network functions. And what we do is basically piggyback an additional local information element between the control plane NF and the UPF to say, look, update the packet handling rule, decide when you are going to buffer, and decide when you're going to release the buffer. Having that happen also makes it a lot easier to deliver packets in order. So we looked at evaluating something like bringing down a page, web page, with a fairly uh, complex amount of images and so on. And when we look at just forget about even the hairpin routing, just going from the 3GPP specified way of using um, a uh, 35GC um, kernel-based implementation. These downlink packets that are buffered, we buffered it at the 5G core, not uh, buffer it at the uh, base stations. We see fairly significant max delays, and that results in spurious retransmissions and so on, which we've, in fact, measured before in the past as well. And with our L25GC, we see a lot less additional delay uh, when we are going through this handover, contributed by this control plane. And very few packets retransmitted. Nothing was dropped. And overall, you can look at the paper to say, if I also reduce um, or get rid of the hairpin routing, or add, c compare it with getting rid of the hairpin routing, we see overall our handover latency improve by a factor of two. The third one, which I'm going to go through very quickly, is looking at how do we do fast PDR lookup and update. Linked list, which is what 3GPP generally has been recommending people to do, not that it's a specification, we looked at our good friend George Varghese's old work on uh, tuple space search, and then also looked at partition sort, which uh, other people have worked on. We compared these different um, PDR lookup performance and how that really has a very critical influence on the data plane performance. What we see is that by looking at partition sort, we're able to actually get much lower data plane latency. And the consequence also has been that you can get much better data plane forwarding performance through the core using this partition sort approach. Finally, the last optimization that we worked on was to look at how do we deal with failures. We really would prefer avoiding having the user device have to reestablish a connection after an NF failure. When we look at failure resiliency, the software failures, which you can basically recover locally, 
And you also have to deal with node failures where you have to uh, recover by having a remote replica. Local resiliency is simple, especially when you're doing something with shared memory, because you don't have to move state around. You're just moving to another NF, which is a backup, and we can make sure that that backup NF is not using CPU resources when it's not needed. For remote resiliency, we've worked on NF resiliency in the past. Others have too. And what we do is to take advantage of this notion of external synchrony so that we can continue to have execution of user events. The load balancer that we have basically buffers packets so that you can basically have a packet logger which can handle failures without losing data packets. And the local replica that we have allows us to then have the remote resilient, uh, remote replica get replicated uh, in the background so it doesn't really take a hit. Let's look at how that performs. And what we see here is we studied the effect of uh, NF failure when you have data uh, flowing and also have a control event that is um, going on at the time when the failure happens. Because that's when you really need to make sure that that state is consistently replicated. So L25GC basically handles the 5G failure or, or, or an NF failure, maintaining normal control and data plane performance, as you see with the blue curve here, very little throughput hit, and relatively small hit in terms of the round trip time for the uh, packets flowing through, the data packets flowing through. 3GPP takes a fairly significant hit, including, obviously, because of the fact that you have to go through and reestablish a connection, means that you're going to have some period that you don't have any data flowing through, and this means that your um, overall performance goes down. So in summary, what we've done is the main piece that we've done is leverage shared memory for NFs to communicate within the 5G core, and that significantly improves the control plane latency by a factor of two, and probably more. And it gets rid of purely the simple service-based interface that is very useful for internode communication, but quite unnecessary when you have to have NFs within a node communicate. The smart buffering really get, introduces no new protocols over the wire, and it allows us to have a factor of two reduction in the handover procedure latency, as well as paging, which to me is an important piece. The fast PDR classification, which is basically the stuff that we've learned from what we do for packet classification in routers, helps us to accommodate what we think is coming in the future. And our approach to basically deal with rest, uh, failure res, uh, restoration allows us to avoid retransmissions, timeouts, and so on that you otherwise would have to experience because you have to reestablish connections or sessions with the 5G core, with the UE, without even considering the overheads that you have for the UE to have to detect that a 5G core session has failed. So overall, our L25GC core considerably improves control plane performance, but you'll see from the paper that it has a direct impact on the data plane performance, both in throughput and latency as well. We have a few limitations because right now our implementation is uh, capable of handling only a small number of users, but we're spending, his students are spending day and night working on 
improving that to support more users. And we have the code now out in the open for folks to use as they wish. Happy to take questions. Yes, Mark. Uh, hi, Kiki. Um, if you've had a network function fail due to a software failure, can you really trust any shared memory state after that point? So I, I agree that you have to have certain models of failure that you can handle. Um, and the question is, if you have a network function that is updating state, and you say, well, I'm not going to have any shared memory. I'm going to have a replica remotely. And I'm going to update my state into some external state repository. And then my replica is going to pick up from that state. There's really no reason for me to trust that state either. Right? So the question is, what are these models that, of failures that we can handle well? and what we cannot handle, and then how do we verify those failures or verify that the updates that we make to the state are things that you can depend on. And that's a common problem, not just because it's shared memory or not. Yeah, I guess I agree. It's, um, but it's probably more likely that when software fails and it randomly writes over memory, that that writes over a shared memory segment, then it actually goes and corrupts what it sends remotely. So that's why I try working very hard with my colleagues in software engineering, because I don't know how to program other than in Fortran. <laughs> but I work with these guys who say, hey, look, I can help you verify what your code does, at least in terms of what you touch in memory state that is critical. OK, thanks. There's another question. Here. Yeah, thanks for this very dense <laughs> presentation. Sorry. Maybe I should I pick one or two paper. ideas only. But Yeah, I, I, it's definitely some interesting ideas, and I have to read them up. Um, so you've been really optimizing for one metric only, which is latency, right? And for sure, there's a cost attached no. to it. That control plane latency improvement does not mean that I am going to compromise in terms of throughput. So okay? I'm not talking about throughput. For example, for um, the next generation 6G, there's a lot of discussion about uh, simplifying things, reducing complexity. And reducing complexity means trying to avoid dependencies, right? So do you have any idea on, like, I mean, complexity is not a, a it's not a well-defined metric, but it sounds like you actually increase complexity here. So I, I must say, I don't increase complexity. The complexity that is there is in the god-awful 3GPP protocol. And I have tried swimming up the waterfall for the last four or five years by saying, hey, we should reduce that complexity that 3GPP protocol is a bear. But you know, there's only so much you can do by saying, well, I, as a researcher, I'm going to come up with a new clean slate protocol. And so I'm looking at how I can start by having a sensible implementation of this complex protocol, look at what changes I can do to improve what exists, and hopefully, in the process, have a vehicle to slowly introduce protocol improvements. I mean, that's, there are probably more costs, like more buffer usage and whatever. So like, I just think you need to look at a different spectrum of metrics for your evaluation. More buffer usage. So I'm, not, I'm actually trying to reduce buffer occupancy because I'm trying to reduce the amount of time that I'm going to be buffering while I'm going through this handover process, that handover process is outside of the control of just this implementation, because I need to have all those protocol exchanges. Half of them are crazy, but some, uh, they have to be undergone if you're going to be compliant with having to deal with a 3GPP base station and uh, mobile device, 
Um, I would like to have them all change by command saying, I want to have a new protocol, but I've given up on that. Okay, thanks. It has Sounds to like gradually happen. I definitely read your, have to read your paper. Thanks. Please. Okay, so uh, before taking any more questions from the audience, uh, there's a question from uh, Julie Zhang from the Slack channel. I want to read out, so maybe uh -oh. answer. <laughs> He's going to put me in trouble. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is a question for you in your evaluation. Are there PDR rules coming from some real operational 4G and 5G networks, no. or are they synthetically generated? Synthetically generated. Okay, so actually he even says to be more specific, what might be some examples of PDR rules that are commonly used in cellular network? So right form, now, the number of PDR rules. rules that are used in a cellular network is two maybe three mm -hmm. per session. And they're based on that notion that a user session is like a circuit switched, maybe virtual circuit session between the 5G core and the end user device. And what we are looking at is if you're going to move to a real packet environment, then you're going to have to support a lot more flows for a session. Mm -hmm. And we've been thinking primarily about this rural broadband, where we think that there's going to be a large number of flows for that virtual UE. And that is why we want to have this uh, more richer packet handling capability. But it's not something that's been deployed. One can say it's a figment of our imagination. But we believe that it will come. OK. OK, thank you, KK. Let's take the last question from the audience. Yeah. So um, I wonder if you could uh, comment a little bit on some of the related work. So uh, are there other efforts on reducing latency? Uh, how do you sort of relate this to some of those? Uh, is a major uh, aspect of this that it is open source as opposed to more proprietary? And uh, have you talked to cellular providers, and is there interest in using some of this? So I'm riding on the coattails of JC here, okay. who has built this free 5GC platform uh, over the last four or five years, I think. And he's had a whole range of people use it including people who pay money to him. Lots of millions of dollars, apparently. But um, it's, of course, outside of the US. And um, we see interest in what we are doing here as a seamless transition from what those people are using with free 5GC to L2 5GC. You look at ONF, you look at um, Facebook's Magma project. Lots of people are looking at using 35GC, and we want them to transition over to use our L25GC, which is more or less seamless for them. Um, this trying to reduce control plane latency is something that others have had, uh, worked on before. I maybe I should have spent more time talking about related work here, but it's in the paper. And I myself have been uh, going at that windmill with this Clean G protocol, which was also meant primarily to reduce control plane latency. And there's a bit of that learning that we've brought into this implementation. But our primary effort has been saying, I don't want to change the protocol over the wire or the air interface. OK, thank you. Thank you. Do, we, do you want to ask this question? Can I? Can? OK, thank you. Um, so you were talking about some of your goals on, on resilience. And of course, the scale in 5G, if you're talking about 5G um, packet core running on operators or smaller 5G deployments that run on private 5G, they have a very different scale, and they have also very different ways of solving um, yeah, resilience issues. 
because the operators are very much more regulated than the private 5Gs that are going to run in some factory floor. Um, so to that question, you benchmarked your 5G new implementation against another free 5G um, implementation. And you mentioned the scale, the size that is still small, the number of users. My question is, how did you create load? Like which tooling you used so to create load? So there's this UE RAN SIM that we've been using for creating load, but you know, some of the things that we did, we had to have a little bit more control. So my students and JC students basically used a simple load generator that we had our own control over. What's the name of that? Moon Gen, but you know, you can pick whatever you want. But basically there it's generating packet traffic from a small number of user sessions. And um, much of what we are doing here is using the simple continuous flow packets. I have used uh, other um, packet generators that people in the um, operator world also use. Like um, those, the, the, these are folks from um, Germany who have taken T-Mobile's representative user sessions and um, replicated that sort of, and that's uh, the same sort of thing that we've also used. Um, but what I'm doing here is sufficiently generic to say a control plane event rather than a full user, a typical user session. And you know, in the past have um, presented in other papers how a typical user session would experience uh, performance in terms of throughput and delay. But here we're just looking at individual actions only. And for that, you don't need a representative user session behavior. Okay, thank you, KK. Thank you, thank you everyone. This concludes the session for 5G Network.